You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. This is a reading of a cycle of lectures by Rudolf Steiner entitled Eurythmy Therapy, translated by Alan Stott. And this is uh, lecture three, given in Dornacht on the 14th of April, 1921. In order to proceed in an appropriate manner, we will prepare the ground today for certain matters to be deepened physiologically and psychologically tomorrow by considering the forms which consonants take in eurythmical movement. In what has been developed as the form involved in consonantal movement, consideration has been truly given to everything that has to be taken into account when you attempt to penetrate into the outer world through speech. The person who sets himself the task of observing speech will see that man's confrontation with the outer world consists, on the one hand, of vigorously living into the world, of making himself selfless and living into the world. In the vowels, he comes to himself. In the vowels, he goes within, and unfolds his activity there. In the consonants, he becomes, in a way, one with the outer world, although to varying degrees. These varying degrees of unification with the world are manifest in certain practices within language as well. In the development of the consonantal element in eurythmy, particularly in reference to the sensory, supersensory observation, of which I so often speak in introducing eurythmic performances, it is necessary to consider whether the human being objectifies himself. We have to discover whether in a spoken sound a man objectifies himself completely in order to lay hold of the spiritual element in the things outside him, or if, despite this objectification of himself, he remains more within not going completely out of himself, but instead reproducing the external within himself. That is a major distinction, by reason of which I must ask Frau Baumann to be so good and show us, first of all, the the movement for H. Now, please regard this H movement together with Frau Baumann, and Frau Baumann will demonstrate the F movement. Now, keep an eye on what you can observe here in these two different movements. You can observe what is present by virtue of the human instinct in the attempt to enunciate the sound in question. Consider the pronunciation of H. You actually say HA. You follow up with a vowel. It is impossible to sound a consonant without it being tinged by a vowel. You follow it up up with an A. The pure consonant is vocalized, combined with a vowel. If you Consider the F, you will find that your linguistic instinct places an A, an E, whatever, in front of it, F. Here the opposite occurs, an E is, excuse me, an A is set before it. Through the foregoing, you will perceive that when a man utters an H sound, he makes a greater effort to uncover, through speech, the spiritual element in the external object. When he utters an F sound, his effort is directed more toward re-experiencing the spiritual within himself. Consequently, the manner in which the consonant arises is entirely different, according to whether the vowel tinges the consonant from the front or from the back, if I may use this manner of expression in respect to the nature of consonantal articulation. This you will find conveyed in the form you have observed. Perhaps uh, Fräulein Wolfram will do the H once again. H, here you have an energetic unfolding into the outer world. One doesn't wish to remain in oneself. One wants to go out and live in the external world. F, you see the decided effort to avoid entering into the outer world too sharply, to remain in the inner experience. Now, when we take this into consideration, we can carry on from here to form an idea of various matters which, although they are to become part of Eurythmy, were initially unnecessary 
as far as we have been concerned with eurythmia as an art, but which will become necessary the more this art is extended to other languages. The moment one says not f but phi, it, or excuse me, phi, it is a different matter. In that moment, one attempts to embrace the external with the sound as well. This is indicated, excuse me, this is indicative of an important historical fact. In ancient Greece, people attempted to grasp the external, even in those things in respect to which our contemporaries have become inward. You see how you, you can follow into the outermost fringes of man's experience what I have expressed, for example, in my book titled The Riddles of Philosophy, this going out and taking hold in the external world of what man today already experiences entirely inwardly in his eye, his ego. The reason why spiritual science is not accepted because of such facts is solely because the people of our civilization are generally too lazy. They have to take too many things into account in order to come to the truth, and they want to make it easier for themselves. But that just won't do. They want to make everything easier for themselves, and that won't do. That, for the present, in respect to one element which flowed into the formation of the consonants. If we want to understand the formation of consonants in the realm of eurythmy, then we should consider a second element to which I believe people pay less attention nowadays in teaching, even in physiology, speech physiology, than the third element which we will come to in a moment. In order to form an impression, I will ask you to compare once again. Here it is important that you form a contemplative picture. Naturally, one cannot penetrate to the very end of what one has in such a picture, to the concept. Perhaps Frau Baumann will be so good as so good and do the H again, and once the tone has faded away, Frau Baumann will do a D for us. Pay attention to this case. Pay attention in this case to the following. When you contemplate the H, you will find the movement for it initially deviates greatly from what takes place in speaking it, since in respect to the characteristic of which I am thinking at the moment, the eurythmical element has to stand as polar opposite to the actual process in speech. You know that the speech process, as I presented it the day before yesterday, is a reflecting back from the larynx. The eurythmical process must express this outwardly. It expresses it in movement. In certain instances, one must go over the exactly opposite po excuse me. In certain instances, one must go over to the exactly opposite pole. This is particularly characteristic of H and D. In the case of other consonants, this element has to be toned down. Now, what sort of a sound is H? H is essentially a breath sound. The H is actually brought into being through blowing, where you have to blow in speaking. You have to make a decided shoving thrust. When you enter D, you have this thrusting effect in the pronunciation. In eurythmy, we must polarize this by transforming it into the characteristic movement that is present in D. Here the thrusting quality of speech is lamed when one conveys the sound through movement. So you see that precisely this characteristic has to be taken particularly into account when we have either a breath sound or a plosive sound. Now, sounds are not only either breath sounds or plosives, but by what reason are they one or the other? You see, when one has a decided breath sound, one expresses by means of the blowing the fact that one really wants to go out of oneself. One expresses in the thrusting that this going out of oneself is difficult, that one would like to remain within. For this reason, the eurythmical transposition of the sound has to take place in the manner you have seen. Now there are also sounds that carefully connect the inward with the outward, sounds that are actually physiologically so constituted that with them one states that one is bringing to a standstill 
arresting that in which one would like to be active in such a manner that the inward would immediately become outward, where one would enter into the movement immediately with the whole human being. This is decidedly evident in only one sound in our language, the R. It is, however, for this reason, the most inclusive sound. When you say R, you would like to run after the speech organism with every limb, as I would like to express it. Actually, with R, one strives to bring this pursuit to rest. The lips want to follow when they pronounce the labial R and bring this running after to a halt. The tongue wants to follow when it speaks the lingual R. And finally, the palate wants to follow when the palatal R sounds. These three R's are distinctly different from one another, but they are nevertheless one. In Eurythmy they are expressed thus, Frau Baumann, R. The bringing into swing of what one usually brings to a standstill is expressed. It is precisely the running after the movement of the sound that is expressed in the R. And when you want to express the other element, you can express the labial R by carrying the movement further downward. The lingual R can be made more in the horizontal, and the palatal R rather more upward. By this means one can modify the R sound in the eurythmical movement. But you see that the form is determined by leaving the vibration of the R in the background and expressing the, in quotes, running after. The L, Frau Wolfram L, is a similar sound where we have not a vibrating but a sort of wave in the movement. You see that there is something of the same movement in it as in the R, but the running after is gentle and comes to rest. It is a wave rather than a vibration that comes to expression. That is what is connected inwardly, physiologically, with the shading through the vowel element of the consonantal sound and with the shading through feeling, which already leads to a greater extent into the physical. We can arrive at the outermost division of the sounds by considering the organs. If, once again, we compare the respective movements, we will arrive at the most outward, the most external principles of division through our contemplative picture. Frau Baumann, B. That is a B, and now we will continue directly perhaps with a T, Frau Baumann, T. Now you can see from the position which as the third element, must be taken into account, and which makes itself quite apparent to sensory, supersensory contemplation, that in the case of B we are dealing with a labial sound, and in the case of T with a dental sound. Fräulein Wolfram, please do a K for us. K, here one starts with the position, and the essential lies in the movement. Here we have to do with a palatal sound which in its pronunciation in the tone in which it is spoken, is the quietest, but which has to be transformed in movement into its polar opposite when performed outwardly in eurythmy. The consonants overlap in respect to their characteristics. One division extends into another. The following may serve as an aid. Take the labial sounds. I will write out only the most distinctive of them. W, which equals V, B, P, F, M. You can determine to what extent the vowel coloring is involved by pronouncing the sounds. I don't need to indicate that. Let us take the dental sounds. D, T, S, SH, L. The English TH and N. And now the palatal sounds. G, K. H and the French ng, more or less. We will have to write the R in everywhere, since it has its nuances everywhere. Considering the process of division from the other point of view now, I will underline with white where we have to do with a definite breath sound. F, excuse me, V, F, S, SH, and H as well, more or less. 
These would be the decided breath sounds. I will underline in red where we have to do with what are called clearly plosives. B, P, M, D, T, N, and then perhaps G and K. The vibratory sound is R. We have to do with the distinct undulating sound, which, because of the soft transformation in the movement, must be in a sense of an inward character, fundamentally only in the case of L. These three organizational principles, the vowel, coloring, the blowing, thrusting, vibrating, and undulating, and all that which has to do with the external division into dental, labial, and palate sounds, All this comes to expression in the forms given for eurythmy. It must be clear to you, of course, to what degree these principles of division affect each other. With L, for example, we have to do with the distinct dental sound, which must have all the characteristics of a dental sound. Then, having to do with a gliding sound, with an undulant sound, it must have the characteristics of a wave. Apart from that, it is a strong connection to the inward. We have to do with a coloring from within outward, at least in our language. We don't say le, but el. Here we have the transition from earlier forms, in which people reached yearningly into the exterior world. As a result, a word lambda, the eleventh letter of the Greek alphabet, was used in order to express such an event in order to bring this going over into the external to proper expression. Thus in each of the letters we have to do with a picture of that which is taking place inwardly. Before we consider the consonants individually, let us contemplate the following. Yesterday we were able to show that ah, which we also studied in its metamorphosis, has to do with all those forces in man that make him greedy, which organize him according to animal nature. The ah, in fact, lies nearest to to the animal nature in man, and in a certain sense one can say that when the ah is pronounced, it sounds out of the animality of man. And certainly, as spiritual investigation confirms, ah is the sound that was the very earliest to appear in the course of both the phylogenetic phylogenetic evolution, as well as the ontogenetic evolution of man. So we're reading that. Both the phylogenetic evolution as well as the ontogenetic evolution of man. In ontogenetic evolution, it is somewhat hidden, of course. There is a false evolution as well, as you know. The ah was the first sound to appear in humankind's evolution, resounding initially, however, entirely out of the animal nature. And when we tend toward ah with the consonants, we are still calling on what are animal forces in man. As you could see yesterday, the whole sound is actually formed accordingly. If we use the sound therapeutically in the manner in which it presented itself to our souls yesterday, we can combat that which makes children and grown-ups too into smaller and larger animals. With such exercises, we can have very respectable results in the de-animalization of man. And now, let us go on to the sound oo, for example. We said yesterday that this is the sound we use therapeutically when a person cannot stand. You saw that yesterday. It is the sound which, in a certain respect, expresses its physiological, pathological connection already in the manner in which it is formed in speech. The oo is spoken with the mouth and the openings between the teeth constricted to the greatest degree and with the lips somewhat extended, in such a way, however, that the mouth opening is narrowed and the lips can vibrate. You can see that in speaking one seeks an essentially outward movement with the oo. In the pronunciation of oo, the attempt to characterize something moving predominates. Thus, with the eurythmical oo, the physiologic opposite occurs. The ability to stand firm is called forth. This is present in the oo in artistic eurythmy as well. 
at least as a suggestion. If you now take a look at the other vowels, you will find a progressive internalization. In the case of the O, you have the lips pushed together toward the front and the opening of the mouth reduced in size. There is at least an attempt to reduce the size. This is transformed into the polar opposite in the encompassing gesture of the O movement in Eurythmy. Precisely in such things, the natural connections are to be perceived. In the manner in which O is employed in speech, certain forces are present. And in languages in which O predominates, one will find that the people have the greatest propensity to become obese. They may really be taken as a guideline for the study of the physiologic processes connected with speech. If one were to develop a language consisting principally of modifications of O, where people had to carry out the characteristic mouth and lip formation of the O continuously, they would all become pot-bellied. If with the O on the one hand, one has this propensity to become pot-bellied, as I would like to call it, it is easy to understand why, when reversed, the O represents, on the other hand, that which combats this obesity when it is carried out eurythmically and in the metamorphosis demonstrated yesterday. The state of affairs is different, for example, with A. A language that is rich in A will engender skinny people, weaklings, and that is related to what I said yesterday about the treatment of thin people and thus of weaklings in relation to the significance of A. You will remember that I said that in the case of weaklings, particularly the A movement with its given modification is to be applied. Now, in respect to all these matters, it is necessary, however, to take one thing into account. If we consider the forms outwardly, we do not come to the truth of the matter. We must grasp them inwardly in the process of their becoming. We must concentrate less on what comes to outward expression and more on the tendency involved. The tendency to become fat can be combated by means of the O and the tendency to remain thin by the A. Attention must be drawn to these matters because when eurythmy is used for therapeutic purposes, it is necessary to take more into consideration the forces that are present in the upper man tending to a widening and the forces present in the lower man tending to the linear. If so, I have to say that when man utters the O, he actually broadens the living element. And there's a diagram. You see, when I draw it roughly, the head of man is in a way a sphere. Speaking spiritually, scientifically, it is a proper reproduction of the earth's sphere. It is a copy of all those forces that are centralized in the sphere of the earth. It is developed by what lies in the forces of the moon. This latter builds it up in such a manner that it becomes a sort of earth sphere. Of course, this is all actually connected with cosmology and cosmogony. As the earth phase proceeded out of the moon phase, so out of the forces that are so powerfully at work in building up the human head, which of itself, of course, intends to become a sphere, and is modified only by the chest and the other part of the body being attached to it, altering the spherical form, so out of the moon building forces the head is formed. Left to itself, the head would become a proper sphere. That is not the case, because the other two parts of the human organism are connected with the head and influence its shape. When we pronounce the O, we try to express what is expressed in its spherical form in the entire etheric head. One makes the effort to form a second head for oneself. See the outer line of the circle in the drawing. One can really say that in uttering the O, man puffs himself up like his head. He puffs himself up, he blows himself out, awakening thereby the forces at the other pole that give him the tendency to become fat. 
these things can really be taken pictorially as well. The inflating of his own head gives him the tendency to become fat. When one wants to counteract this tendency to become, etherically speaking, a fat head, not really a fat head, but etherically a fat head, to become a big head, then one must attempt to round it off from the other side, to take it back into oneself. And that is the protest of the fat head. Consequently, an O is formed as the opposite pole. All the individual sounds have a nuance of feeling, which is deeply established in the organism because it lies in the unconscious, hence the import of the inner essence of the sound. For the person who looks at the matter in a super-sensory manner, the frog who would like to blow himself up into an ox in the Grimm story, you see, is the one from whom a cannon-like O sound would continuously proceed if he were able to fulfill his intention. That is the peculiarity of it. We have to explain by means of such things if we want to understand these matters inwardly. With the A, it is distinctly the reverse. In A, one wants to take hold of oneself inwardly, wants to contract together inwardly. For that reason, there is the touching of oneself in Eurythmy, this this becoming aware of oneself. You become aware of yourself, simply, when you place the right arm upon the left, just as when you feel an object outside yourself. When you take hold of it, you become aware of yourself. It would be even more clearly expressed if you simply grasped the right arm with the left hand. In art, only an indication of all these things can be given. When you grasp the right arm with the left hand, you are feeling yourself. This contacting oneself has come to expression, especially in the eurythmical A. And this touching oneself is carried out throughout the whole human organism. You can study this touching of yourself simply by studying the relationship of the nerve process in the human back. Those that ordinary physiology mistakenly call the motor nerves and those that are called sensory. Here, where the motor nerve, which is basically a sensory nerve too, comes together with the sensory nerve, a similar sort of clasping occurs. The fact is that the nerve strands on the human back continually form an A. In this forming of the A lies the way in which man's inward perception of himself, which is factually differentiated in the brain, comes into being. Yesterday we attempted to reproduce this A forming, which actually takes place in a plane. You will find that what we attempted to reproduce shows through the outward movement and the position of the movement how this inward A forming in man is summed up in the vertical axis. As the head puffs itself out and wants to become a horn-blowing cherub, this A process, this pulling oneself together into a point, sums itself up in the vertical, in the perpendicular. It is a continuous and successive fastening together of A's, which stand one above another, that expresses clearly what one observes taking place in weaklings. They have the tendency continuously to stretch their etheric bodies. They want to extend the etheric body rather than to pull it together into a point, which would be the real antithesis to the activity of the head. That is not, however, the case. They try to stretch the etheric body, thereby making a repetition of the point. And this extension, which makes its appearance in people who are becoming weak, not the stretching in the physical, but the stretching in the etheric body, will be counteracted by shaping that A of which we spoke yesterday. So, I believe, you will see how there is an inward connection between the eurythmical element involved and the human formative tendencies. How what is present in him as formative tendencies has been drawn out of the human being. The fact is that these formative tendencies, expressing themselves first in growth, in the forming of man, in his configuration, 
become specialized and localized once again in the development of the speech organism, this special organism. There these formative tendencies, which are otherwise spread out over the entire person, are to an extent accumulated. In developing eurythmy, we now return. We proceed from the localized tendency to the whole man, thus placing another specialization in opposition to the specialization of the human organization in the speech organism, the specialization in the will organism. The whole human being is indeed an expression of his volitional nature, insofar as he is, throughout, metabolic and limb organism. One can move this or that part of the head too, and consequently the head is also in a certain sense limb organism. That can be demonstrated by those people who are capable in this respect of a little more than others, people who can wiggle their ears and so on. They can show very clearly how the principle of movement of the limbs, the limb nature, extends into the organization of the head. The whole human being is, in this respect, an expression of the volitional nature. When we go on to Eurythmy, we express this volition once again. Before we proceed tomorrow to work out the sounds specifically, to the special manner of forming them, and further to the combinations of sounds, I would like to speak, in closing, of something historical. The movement of the will and the movement of the intellect, you see, constitute two sorts of evolution of power which proceed in man at different velocities. Man's intellect develops quickly in our age, volition slowly. So that as part of the whole evolution of mankind, we have already surpassed our will with our intellect. In our civilization, it is generally manifest that the evolution of the intellect has overtaken the evolution of the will. The people of today are intensely intellectual, which precisely does not imply that they can do much with their intellect. They are strongly intellectual, but they hardly know what to do with their intellect. For this reason, they know so little intellectually. But what they do know intellectually they treat in such a manner as though within it they could function with certainty. Will develops slowly. And to practice eurythmy is, apart from everything else, an attempt to bring the will back into the whole evolution of humankind again. If eurythmy is to appear as a therapy, the following must be pointed out. It must be said that the overdevelopment of the intellect expresses itself particularly in the organic side effects of the evolution of speech as well. Our speech development today in our modern civilization is actually already something which is becoming inhuman through its superhuman qualities. Insofar as we learn languages today in such a manner that we have so little living feeling left for what lies in the words. The words are actually only signs. What sort of feeling do people still command for what lies in words? I would like to know how many people go through the world and become aware in the course, for example, of learning the German language, that the rounded form which I have just drawn is expressed in the word Kopf, head, which has a connection with Kohl, cabbage, for which reason one also says Kohlkopf, cabbage head, which is actually only a repetition. The rounding is metamorphosed according to the situation. That is what is expressed here. In the Romance languages, testa, testieren, expresses more what comes from within, the working of the soul through the head. People have no more feeling for the distinctions within language. Language has become abstract. When you walk, you walk with your feet. Why do we say fusa, feet? You see, that is a metamorphosis of the word furcha, furrow, which came about because it was seen that one traces something like a furrow when one walks. The pictorial element in language has been completely lost. If one wishes to bring this pictorial element back into language, then one must turn to eurythmy. Every word that is experienced non-pictorially 
is actually an inward cause of illness. I am speaking with coarse words now, but then we only have coarse words, of something which expresses itself in the finer human organism. Civilized humankind suffers chronically today with the effects which learning to speak abstractly, which the failure to experience words pictorially, has upon it. The results are so far-reaching that in those people who have made their language abstract, the accompanying organic side effects express themselves as a very strong tendency toward irregularities in the rhythmic system and a refusal to function of the metabolic system. However, we can actually do something about what is being spoiled in people today through language, which is acquired, of course, in early childhood. If it is acquired in a non-pictorial way, it really produces conditions leading later on to all kinds of illnesses. We can actually fight against this with the help of therapeutic eurythmy. Eurythmy therapy may be introduced in a thoroughly organic manner into therapeutic treatment as a whole. It is truly so. The person who understands that developing oneself spiritually has always something to do with becoming ill, this must be taken into account in the course of spiritual development, must also take into consideration that one can fight this process of becoming ill, which is due to our civilization, not alone with outward physical studies, studien, but also with outward methods, remedies, mitteln. We put soul and spirit into the movements of eurythmy and combat thereby what on the other side soul and spirit do themselves, though often in earliest childhood, in such a manner that the effect of their activity when it develops in later life is felt to be the cause of illness. That is what I wanted to say today. The end of Lecture 3